Good evening and welcome to our third event for the month of May Education and Awareness Series. I'm Kelly Tregash, the Programs Coordinator for the Environmental Health Association of Quebec. This event is titled Practical Tips to Reduce Exposures for People Experiencing Multiple Chemical Sensitivity with Dr. Tomanika Tembasco. This is a webinar, so you're automatically muted and your camera is off. If you have any questions, please send them using the chat to the hosts and panelists your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. All our events for this month are dedicated to the memory of Dr. Lynn Marshall. In the days to come, we'll be sharing more information with you via email about the availability of the three presentations for the month of May on our website, including today's presentation. Dr. Lynn Marshall has had a tremendously successful career as a physician spending over 55 years working in comprehensive family medicine, occupational medicine, environmental medicine, general practice psychotherapy slash hypnotherapy and epidemiological research. She was the recipient of numerous awards in environmental medicine and Lynn was an advisor to ASAC EHAC where she provided her knowledge, expertise and support to help build the association to the organization that it is today. We will now have a moment of silence in her memory. We will begin with a territorial acknowledgement. Aseki Hek recognizes the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation, whose traditional and unceded territory we're on today. We would like to pay tribute to these Indigenous peoples and their descendants. Hello, I am Rohini Perez, President and CEO of the Environmental Health Association of Quebec. Welcome to our third presentation for the month of May. The presentation is titled Practical Tips to Reduce Exposures for People Experiencing Multiple Chemical Sensitivity by Dr. Dominica Tambasco. Dr. Tambasco is a fellow of the College of Family Physicians of Canada and has been practicing family medicine since 2004. Since 2016, she has been a consulting physician at the Environmental, Environmental Health Clinic at Women's College Hospital where she integrates her knowledge about environmental impacts on human health to help her patients. Dr. Dambasco completed her dip diploma in occupational environmental health at McMaster University in 2010 and continues to expand her knowledge through numerous related courses. She completed her graduate degree at the Institute of Medical Sciences with a collaborative specialization in environmental health and musculoskeletal health. Dr. Tambasco is dedicated to teaching in the health professions and has been a lecturer in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto since 2012, as well as the Department of Pharm Pharmacology and Toxicology since 2018. She has also received several awards for her dedication to educational scholarship. In her spare time, she has organized six successful fundraising events for various non-governmental organizations, including CAPE and Doctors Without Borders. Dr. Tambasco's most recent endeavor is to explore the connections between common toxicants and health effects with a special interest in multiple chemical sensitivities. A work in progress is her creation of an educational resource for medical professionals to provide tools for, for the assessment prevention, and treatment of environmentally linked illnesses. I now present to you Dr. Dominica Tambasco, slide one. Thank you. Good day. And thank you, special thank you to ASEC for inviting me to speak today. My name is Dominica Tambasco. I'm a physician at the Environmental Health Clinic at Women's College Hospital in Toronto. Today, I will be speaking to you about strategies to reduce exposures to common, tech, common chemical triggers for people experiencing multiple chemical sensitivity. In this presentation, we will review some practical tips to prepare for, prevent, mitigate, or manage exposures to commonly encountered triggers by people living with multiple chemical sensitivities. 
we will look at four domains, home, workplace, community, and transportation. The points made will be general and by no means exhaustive. As a memory aid, I use mnemonics such as the four Ps for commonly encountered toxicants, triggering MCS, and the four I's for routes of exposure. The most difficult route of exposure to control is inhalation, as we cannot always control the air that we breathe. The least obvious route is the invisible one, having to do with me mechanical, for example, sound and electromagnetic pollution, both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. However, we will not be speaking about the latter physical exposures, as the focus of this talk today is on the chemical exposures. In my experience, I have found that people living with multiple chemical sensitivities often need to make many changes in response to their situation in order to reduce symptoms and suffering. The strategies employed include mitigate, that is alleviate symptoms by trying to create a bubble environment, educate family, friends, coworkers, or community about their condition, advocate for public support of their cause, and litigate by taking a claim to court. Over the last few decades, there has been greater recognition of the potential toxicities of environmental pollutants and their impacts on health. In the United States, this has been monitored in part by the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which was started in 1999. In Canada, the Canadian Health Measure Survey has been conducting human biomonitoring of over 250 chemicals in blood, urine, or serum since 2007. The aim of this ongoing survey is to estimate exposure to environmental chemicals with data collected in two year cycles. As has already been presented by my colleagues in this series, the criteria generally used to diagnose multiple chemical sensitivity is based on the consensus statement from 1999. It is important to note that some countries and agencies have recognized multiple chemical sensitivities as a pathology and that multiple chemical sensitivities is considered a disability in several jurisdictions, including in the Ontario and Canadian human rights codes. And though not fully defined, the World Health Organization codifies MCS as either unspecified respiratory conditions due to inhalation of fumes, gases, and chemical vapors, or unspecified allergies or hypersensitivity involving the nitric oxide system. In Ontario, the Human Rights Code provides for equal rights and opportunities to people with disabilities who may, in some cases, require accommodations, for example, in housing, employment, or services. In Canada, the main federal laws which protect people with disabilities from discrimination include the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Canadian Human Rights Act. Quebec, Manitoba, Ontario, Nova Scotia, and most recently, British Columbia, are the only provinces in Canada that have their own accessibility legislation. Quebec was the first province to pass an accessibility law in 1978. In Ontario, the purpose of the Accessibility for Ontarians Act is to develop, implement, implement, enforce accessibility standards for Ontarians with disabilities. At the federal level, the Accessible Canada Act only came into force on July 11th, 2019. The purpose of the Accessible Canada Act is to make Canada barrier free by January 1st, 2040. It aims to achieve this through identifying, removing and preventing barriers in federally regulated priority areas, such as employment and transportation. In the home domain, 
there are many possible chemical exposures that can affect anyone's health, but in particular are felt by people experiencing multiple chemical sensitivity. These include, but are not limited to, volatile organic compounds and solvents from various household products and furnishings, as well as exhaust fumes and gases from both indoor and outdoor sources. Although not an exhaustive list, the following slides provide some general tips to reduce chemical exposures via inhalation, ingestion, and skin. To reduce inhalation exposures in the home, it is important to ventilate, to change the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning unit filter regularly, remove dust, read labels to avoid fragranced products, avoid smoking or burning, anything and ensure proper functioning of carbon monoxide detectors. Other measures include prevention of mold growth through repair of water leaks and controlling moisture, choosing safer cleaning alternatives, choosing safer cooking methods and cookware, avoiding the use of pesticides and off-gassing products and aerating the garage which is a source of vehicle exhaust entering the home. When renovating a home, it is important to research the specifications, but even low off-gassing products may require aerating before use. It may be helpful to choose certified options such as Green Label Plus, which certifies very low emissions or CARB, the California Air Resource Board, which establishes establishes legally allowable levels at VOCs for California, or CertiPure, a certification created by the polyurethane industry to certify polyurethane foam, or certified asthma and allergy friendly products. While these certifications do not guarantee that they are free of chemical triggers, they are a good place to start. Given the high prevalence of dust and dust mite allergies, I would also recommend using certified dust mite protectors for pillows and mattresses. Other home considerations that may reduce exposures to triggering chemicals include air purifiers and water filtration systems. For years, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation has recognized the special housing needs of individuals disabled by environmental hypersensitivities. However, they do not legislate or enforce building or construction standards. In Ontario, the municipalities usually have the legal authority to administer and enforce the Ontario Building Code and Act. Except for the prohibition of certain toxic substances at, under federal regulation, for example, urea formaldehyde foam insulation, there are no standards requiring the use of the least toxic materials in home construction, with new homes often composed of harmful or off-gassing materials, such as PVC plastics or adhesive containing pressed wood or particle boards. For some people living with MCS, the lack of accessible housing, that is housing that is free of these noxious chemicals, poses a great barrier, and in extreme cases has led to homelessness. While it is a human right not to be discriminated on the grounds of disability, enforcement of this right is not necessarily guaranteed. In one instance, a legal action was undertaken at the federal level for human rights discrimination. The case was won in 2012 after a four year battle with the CRA for denial of a tax credit for home renovations required to manage severe MCS. With the help of Equal Justice and Arch Disability Law, center, a settlement was made. In the workplace, common exposures often affecting people with MCS include fragrance products, plug-in or other air fresheners, cleaning chemicals, disinfectants or sanitization products, off-gassing equipment or furnishings, poor air quality due to the ventilation system, renovation fumes, manufacturing or industrial processes, construction dust or chemicals and pesticides, among others. A 
A detailed work exposure history will help identify the specific areas of concern in the workplace. Workplace Hazardous Materials Information System, WIMS, is a Canada-wide law to ensure that chemicals and hazardous substances are handled safely through labeling, material safety data sheets, and worker training. All workers have the right to investigations into the workplace chemical safety when a concern arises. In the next slide, we will see how occupational asthma is managed in the workplace. The Canadian Centre for Occupational Health and Safety recognizes the effects of chemical exposures in the workplace, such as sensitizer-induced asthma and irritant-induced asthma, also called reactive airway dysfunction syndrome. The latter is triggered by chemicals such as chlorine, ammonia, or smoke, among other irritants. Like work-related asthma, MCS should be considered in a worker experiencing organ system effects from respiratory to neurological, linked or made worse by workplace chemical exposures. For people with multiple chemical sensitivities, workplace accommodation, accommodations can include removing the trigger chemicals, choosing safer alternatives, working from home, and improving ventilation and air filtration. For some accommodations, the employer and the union may require documentation, generally in the form of a medical letter stating the functional impairments triggered by exposures and the necessity to accommodate. A better approach is the implementation of appropriate policies such as fragrance-free policy in the workplace, as has been implemented in some hospitals. In this slide, we have an example of a scent-free policy in the workplace, taken from the Canadian Centre for Occupational Health and Safety website. If your employer is not familiar, you can share this with them and with your union or health and safety officer. There are multiple sources of pollution in the community, which can cause harmful health effects in anyone. However, MCS sufferers tend to feel these effects at lower levels. They are like the proverbial canaries in the coal mine. Examples of chemical exposures in the community are emissions from vehicles, industry, sewage plants, dumping sites, gas or diesel powered landscape equipment, pesticides and smoke. A common and increasing problem in some buildings, including in schools, is mold due to high moisture or water leaks. Mold may produce toxic substances called mycotoxins that can cause or worsen health problems. In addition, moisture damaged building materials can release volatile organic compounds that can also cause health problems. Since 1996, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States addresses indoor air quality concerns in its Healthy Schools programs and provides school tools to assess and action kits to fix indoor air quality problems. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, developed a series of safety checklists for schools, including an indoor air quality self inspection checklist. In Canada, there, are no, there is no central or organized plan, nor any dedicated staff to address or respond to indoor air quality concerns in schools, let alone implement any tools or action kits. However, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, with the help of the Lung Association Canadians for a Safe Learning Environment and individuals designed a flexible kit with a checklist to identify indoor air quality problems that can be used not only in schools, but also homes, offices, and other buildings. Similarly, the Healthy Environments for Kids organization developed a checklist for childcare facilities that can be used in other settings as well. 
The checklist has multiple sections, including one on cleaning and disinfection, food preparation, renovations, and hazardous chemicals. Further tips to reduce chemical exposures in the community include avoidance of polluted places, such as auto body shops, gas stations. Ultimately, however, the solution to the problem is not just avoidance. It is action, regulations, laws, policies, such as no idling, scent-free public spaces, enforcement of stricter pesticide and emission controls, which will likely require broad advocacy from community members. Other tips to reduce community exposure to toxic triggering chemicals are to avoid plastic containers as these are not only bad for the environment, but also bad for health. Instead, bring your own reusable mug or ask for a biodegradable container when ordering out. Advocate to reduce the use or replace gas powered landscape equipment in your community and in your multi-unit dwelling as well as to use safer cleaning supplies in common areas of the building. Advocate to initiate or enforce no idling policies. When attending medical or other appointments, request the first appointment of the day. Ask about the no scent policy, and if none, inform the office of your sensitivity and ask if staff can refrain from use of scented products at the time of your appointment. If attending large events, plan seating, for example, close to an open window in advance and bring rescue medications. Request that accompanying family and or friends refrain from wearing scented products when they're with you. Spend more time in nature or in places with better air quality, such as parks and trails away from vehicles and traffic. Monitor the air quality and schedule your outdoor activities when the ozone levels are lowest, which is usually in the morning. If available, attend outdoor farmers markets for fresh organic produce or consider bulk home delivery. If booking a hotel, contact them in advance to ask about smoke and scent free um, floors or rooms. Inform the hotel of your chemical sensitivity and the measures that will help. For example, not spraying the room with air freshener Choose places that can accommodate. Finally, we will discuss the transportation domain, which encompasses air, train, bus, and car travel. Air pollutants arising from the combustion of fossil fuels include oxides of sulfur and nitrogen, ozone, benzene, carbon monoxide, among other toxicants. Although anyone could suffer the ill effects of these pollutants, people with MCS are particularly affected and at lower levels than tolerated by others. Thus, it is important to reduce these exposures as much as possible. The Canadian Transportation Agency provides an avenue for mediation for individuals who have experienced accessibility issues in federally regulated transportation this excerpt discusses severe allergy provisions in the Accessible Transportation for Persons with Disabilities Regulations. The types of assistance that could be provided by transport carriers are priority boarding, buffer zone, or removing the allergens from the seating area if possible. Those suffering from severe allergies would need to provide medical documentation and inform the carrier in advance of the accommodations needed. Although MCS is not an allergy, sufferers with severe symptoms should also be accommodated as it, is, as it is a recognized disability in the Human Rights Code, which takes precedence over this guide. It is the aim of the new Accessible Canada Act to remove barriers to accessibility by 2040. However, there is of yet no mechanism in place to enforce violations except for individuals to engage in a judicial or quasi-judicial system. This avenue may represent additional barriers for people suffering with MCS, from the potential lack of health professional support to the loss of dignity and stigmatization 
A better approach would be to implement regulations that remove barriers to accessibility, anonymously investigate reported breaches, and enforce regulations. There's only one case in 2010 with the Canadian Transportation Agency regarding environmental sensitivities, which established that medically prescribed oxygen for severe MCS can be permitted for use on board aircraft. On a day-to-day -day level, tips to reduce exposures in transportation include choosing active modes of transport, such as walking or cycling, avoiding sustained exposure to vehicle exhaust, advocating for no idling and scent-free policies, especially, especially in intercity or intra and interprovincial bus, train, or air travel, and phasing out or banning diesel-powered school buses. It is preferable to reduce air travel as the jet diesel-like emissions are very toxic and contain volatile organic compounds and particulate matter. If available, choose electrified transport systems instead. For longer trips on planes, trains, and buses, inform the carrier about your disability. Carriers generally require a medical letter. Therefore, it is recommended that you speak to your healthcare provider in advance. The accommodation letter does not have to state the diagnosis. However, it should state the effects of the or impacts produced by the triggering agents and recommend reasonable accommodations. For example, a buffer zone. At home, it is important to air out the garage before starting and after parking a gasoline powered vehicle. Drive less, never idle. As the saying goes, accessibility benefits everyone. Reducing the toxic chemicals in our home, workplace, community, and transportation not only make these environments more accessible to people living with MCS, but also make it more livable for everyone in the long term. Here are my references for this talk. Again, I would like to thank ASEC for putting together this educational series on multiple chemical sensitivity and welcome any questions. Thank you.